You look so awesome. No. <laughs> the blue on your oh. hair. Thank you. Well, okay. Welcome everybody to our monthly book club. Uh, this month, it's going to be just, I guess, me and Agatha tonight. And we are going to be discussing the book, The Confidence Game by Maria Konnikova. Uh, this book is basically, well, I think you know, one of the reviews Agatha was reading before we started, it was uh, The Anatomy of a Con was basically what it is. And, and I, would, I would say that's very accurate uh, description of what the book is about. So she goes, well, I guess before we jump into that, welcome, Agatha. <laughs> Hi, Nina. Hi, everyone. Hi, hi. So thank you guys for joining us. And before we get in here too much, I just wanted to say the book for next month, and I I lost the cover of it, but it's called um, True Refuge by Tara Brock. And it's a book that's about mindfulness and... um, basically handling crisis and trauma in life. And it's based around mind, it's based around mindfulness. It's based around um, some different types of, a lot of like Buddhist type approaches, but according to the reviews, they said it's very uh, kind of non-denominational and fine for all readers. So- I mean like non-denominational Buddhism? <laughs> no, like non-denominational in general, like it doesn't, focus it's just the mindfulness part of buddhism um so i'll be curious i have not started this book yet uh so i will be curious to see what it's about it has fantastic reviews and if anybody is interested in uh audio books you can go to audibletrial.com slash thrive after abuse and i believe if you sign up you get a free audio book so just something to consider also consider asking your local library uh, for them to carry any of the books that we read in audiobook format. And generally you can listen for free with your library card, which is ever so cool. So I guess with that said, uh, let's just hop into it. So Agatha, I guess, do you want to start? What, what was your take on the book? Okay. So it's, it was pretty, I must say I wanted to, I want, I almost felt that this book is good like for like people who are studying psychology and they want to really understand all the mechanics of the scam and the con game and how it's all based in that crazy, outrageous amount of the confidence that the con artists have, which I really didn't know. Um, for some reason, con confidence, con game, con, you know, con man, I never connected it with confidence. I just... I don't know, like I just, you know, I missed, I missed that part for like most of my life, but it was, it was really interesting. I, I think if you, if you want to know more about, you know, how it all works, it started with a jaw dropping example of that imposter. What was his name? The, um, World of the Mora Jr. who performed 18 centuries. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so before that, I always thought that that con game is out. It, it will always be based in kind of like abstraction, but nothing real is really happening. I mean, like people are losing money and stuff, but I would never think that the con man would perform a surgery. Like mm. just to keep up the illusion of, you know, the, this whole persona that he created. And here's this guy who didn't perform one surgery. He performed 18 surgeries. He enrolled other people in assisting in the surgeries and why he was you major know, surgeries major surgeries like some like of them were amputations. Yeah. <laughs> it was trauma surgeries and to be yeah. a trauma surgeon you have to get really good training and all that is just because he read some medical books and um and you know he was pretending to be a doctor and then the funniest i mean it was crazy but it was also funny the same part is that when he got caught there was no consequence that, and he moved on to, to, to be another imposter and then another imposter. Like he was, he was like teaching medicine somewhere. I was like, this is ridiculous. So I really like how she started with this like really shocking example of the Kong, Kong game because I guess it's really set the context for the whole book. 
Like you just uh -huh. knew that you can expect anything from them if it comes to the con. Like anything is possible. That's a good it, point. Have you ever seen the movie Catch Me If You Can? No, I... It's great. It's uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. It's based on a true story. It's a guy who's a con artist and he plays all of these different roles. And one of them is a doctor. Another one is an airline pilot. And right. And you would think you would think that somebody would stick with something that they could kind of, you know, BS their way through and not be like, yeah, I'm a pilot. Like where, what, how are you getting your train? But he, he snowed all kinds of people for, for years and years and years. And it's a really interesting movie. Highly recommend it. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this, this book she does, she covers a lot of ground. I would classify this book as more of um, like narrative nonfiction for you guys that haven't read it. It's, it truly, it's story after story, after story, after story, after story. Um, about different cons and there's a lot of research that's peppered in there um, about basically about manipulation, why people get caught up in manipulation, the psychology behind it, like what Agatha was saying. It's, it's interesting. Personally, I am not, my brain just does not work like that. I'm not a narrative nonfiction person, but I think I'm, I might be the minority to that because I think a lot of people really like that style and it, it can be very engaging to just hear all of these true stories of people throughout time that were able to, to just con, continue to con their way through life. Well, in, interesting connection was that she made, um, she, she like makes the, the, the nonfiction narrative stories of the different cons throughout the whole books with some like research in between that show why certain dynamic of the con actually works why you know and why it works for on anyone not just certain yes. people and that was really like the most shocking most shocking research was that the smartest you are the more vulnerable you are to the con mm -hmm. i was like what <laughs> i had heard something similar I guess it because it kind of goes hand in hand with cognitive dissonance it, you know one of the reasons people get so tangled up with cognitive dissonance is their ability to rationalize things that don't match up and the smarter a person is the more intelligent a person is the more rationalizations they're able to come up with and this yeah. is one of the reasons that a lot of people um, that are very what you would consider to be very logical, like engineers, scientists, math mathematicians get caught up in cults mm -hmm. uh, because they're only thinking with that logical part of their brain and they're discounting everything that quote unquote feels off, feels wrong. So that's interesting. Yeah, like, like I said before, like you can expect anything in this book and like, there was this woman who spent all her saving and she was a writer. She was a very educated person, I guess. Maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'm making an assumption here, but she was a writer, well-known author. And she spent all her saving because some other woman promised her that she can transfer her dead son body into another boy's, mm. like soul into another boy's body. So like that was really crazy to me. And I was like, okay, you are, traumatized you lost your son so like like though, even though it was super 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 crazy I still could kind of see it happening because this woman was in, you know in the midst of trauma so she was definitely more vulnerable to you know just being played like that because you know but the whole book is filled with examples of people losing their all money savings just in, in the most ridiculous ways. Well, I, I, I guess for me, the shocker was, I, I mean, I, you know, and we all know better, right? These people, there's no limit to, there's no, there's no moral compass whatsoever. And they truly don't care. It's, but to me, it's just absolutely shocking that there's just no line that they won't cross. I mean- Oh no, no, there was a guy, remember? The, he, the tax got, the tax scam, he called a lady and she bursted in tears because she's nine months pregnant. And he's like, oh, don't worry, lady, this is just a scam. 
I was like, that was the only call mm-hmm. out to swim a consciousness. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> that was so funny. Yeah, and I and I guess some of them have them and some of them don't. But the fact that a person would go after a parent who's lost their child yeah. and then sell them on the fantasy of I can put your child's soul into another child and you'll be reconnected um, is is yeah it's just heartbreaking that any and then you know it's bad enough to lose a child but then you lose your life savings on top of that and you just think this poor woman how do you how do you that must have been so challenging to move forward from that um yeah I mean so I'm I'm, you know like I, I was thinking like who would they recommend this book to right so the I guess if you know, knowing someone that has a hard time believing that, you know, smart people can get manipulated, that honest and good people can get manipulated. Like we're not just, you know, like suckers, basically. We're not like stupid people that, you know, didn't know any better and ended up in abusive relationships. Like this book really shows how everyone is vulnerable every single person and the smartest you are the more vulnerable you are and even con con guy like comments they are like they the easiest to con actually <laughs> like it's yeah. like it's it's kind of like shocked me you know in in certain moments because i really didn't think that a grifter can be grifted mm-hmm. i didn't expect to see that but then it really makes sense because the whole con is about, it's like, it's like a magic. It's about you not expecting something happening. You like really being completely focused on a different part of the trick when something else is at play. So the more confident you are in seeing, you know, what you really want to see, the, the more vulnerable you are to be manipulated and played. And that, that really makes sense. But I didn't see it from the beginning. So I guess, you know, it, this book is good to read for people who really want to have, you know, evidence, plenty of evidence, how smart, intelligent, and powerful people can get conned. Yeah. And uh, last Miranda is asking her, she says, well, con men are easiest to con. And, and yes. And so the, just like Agatha was saying, you know, a big part of that is the con artist thinks that he's, he or she is the smartest person in the room. And, but all it takes is just a person that's a bigger con artist than them. It reminds me, if you guys have ever seen the movie, it was big in the nineties, A Fish Called Wanda. <laughs> I remember this one. Yeah, that was the exact premise of it. It was John Cleese and somebody else. And, um, uh, oh, what's her name? Uh, Princess Leia, who played Princess Leia? Um, anyway, um, ah, what's her name? That's going to bug me. Carrie Fisher? No. Carrie Fisher. Yeah. 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 Um, gosh, I remember one name in the whole history of the world. (laughs) Yeah. And, and that, I don't, I don't want to give it away, but it's worth seeing. And it's exactly that. And I think that's such an important point. You know, I, I go round and round and round with people. I just get so upset because, you know, everybody thinks that in this book talks about that. Every Nobody thinks they're going to get conned. No. Everybody thinks that they're smarter than they are and that they're savvier than they are and that these things only happen to other people. And it's such an ignorant, arrogant way to look at, naive way to look at the world. And it sets a person up to fail. It's it's not only victim blaming, but it's dangerous for them because they're walking around with this false confidence thinking like, well, but it hasn't happened to me, you know, I'd be able to, you know, to, to jump out of the way. And it's like, no, you mm-hmm. just haven't met somebody that's that good of a con artist yet, emotional or financial. I'm glad yeah. you said that because I felt that like, I don't think I'm that vulnerable if it comes to financial accounts, but I'm more vulnerable to the emotional ones. So she actually says there that the, we are more vulnerable to the counts, you know, around the things that we have a higher demand on. Mm-hmm. We, like, we, we are in need of something. So like people who already struggle financially are more vulnerable to become financially. So they, 
and that was crazy because they have a bigger need. So they are more desperate. And when they are more desperate, they actually want to believe harder. Like they put their whole heart into believing that something can work because, and I think it's, she, so she doesn't mention that, but for me, I made a connection. You know how people say the law of attraction? Mm-hmm. I was thinking this is that, this is using that law of attraction like to really trip people over here. Because I, I, heard, I, I heard people saying, oh, like, just, just spend more money, just invest more money, and then you're going to have a bit, you know, like more money will come into you. And I was thinking, this literally sounds like a calm game here. Like for me, that map together, because, you know, p- people just are so desperate, they want it. So they're actually putting it out over there, right? Out, yes. Putting out more into the universe. And I don't want to talk about law of attraction because I don't think it makes any sense to me. Uh, but um, the same, you know, emotionally, you can, you know, the more you want to be in a relationship, the more vulnerable you are to be manipulated in, in, in the, um, you know, romantic settings. Yes. Yeah, we, we want to see what we want. We want to believe what we want to believe. And yes. that's what denial is. And that's what delusion is. And uh, except, again, because this stuff's not taught. If, you know, we all joke about, we use these terms like, oh, this person's delusional or, oh, they're in denial. But I really don't think people are able to spot it within themselves when it's happening because we, cause we only joke about it when other people are experiencing that, but it's only really extreme situations that we can see clearly. And, um, you know, it's important to realize like when we're, we're kind of being led down this path. One of the points in the book that I, I wanted to discuss is she had talked about psychics and mystics and, um, kind of, uh, charlatans of, you know, that breed, I guess you could say. And, um, a couple of things that I found interesting with that is one of them was that I guess in New York City that there's a law that they have to have a sign in the window that says for entertainment purposes only mm-hmm. uh, because you get vulnerable people in there that really believe that this person can tell the future and they just they're so hungry for hope and to have that hope fed and to hope that they're going to have answers from beyond. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they still, I'm sure they still lose a ton of money, even if it says it's for entertainment purposes only. And so that was one part of it. The second part was in the book, she talked about um, you know, different psychics and, you know, quote unquote mystics that have been busted over the years and have done jail time for you know, basically fr- defrauding people out of large sums of money and um, mm-hmm. preying upon their hope and, and everything, but I felt like it was really worth pointing out. I, it has been my experience, and if anybody's watched, um, and she talks about this in the in the book too. The James Randi had a show for a while, and he has videos. Um, he stopped his show, I think, back in the eighties. But mm-hmm. um, he was a magician, and he had worked with Harry Houdini, and Houdini was the first one to really become fascinated by psychics and mystics and all of this. And he really added a lot of that into his show. And then he realized, oh my gosh, these people, you call it magic, they understand it's a trick. If you call it psychic, they believe you. And he realized how dangerous this was and how Mm -hmm. people really felt they were just, they wanted to believe so bad. And he even changed up his act to saying, this, I am not psychic. This is a trick. And the more he would protest, the more people thought, oh, it must be real. He's just trying to throw us off the trail. And so he stopped doing um, these types of tricks under the guise that it was real. And so then James Randi hopped on board and they kind of became this dynamic duo of bringing this kind of, um, I would say, faulty thinking. Part of it is is intentional trickery, but I think a large part of it's faulty thinking. And they were bringing this to the attention of the public. And in James Randi's show, what I found so fascinating is the whole premise was he would offer a million dollar prize. And if anybody that came on that claimed some sort of, to have some sort of supernatural power would come on and they would demonstrate their abilities and then they would test their abilities basically against the, you know, the scientific, um, 
you know, um, scientific principles. So they would figure out, okay, what are, what are the odds of chance of, you know, if you guess the symbols on 10 different cards, I don't know, uh, chance. Do they, do they like basically were able to recreate each of the tricks and show all the mechanics behind, right? No, he, he didn't no. recreate them, but he would explain it. So he would say, okay, this is what the baseline for chance would be is if that on average, like if you guess the symbols on 10 different cards, right? Um, that odds of chance would be that you would get three of those 10 right. And so anything that's higher than that, then there's potential for something going on. And if that's the case, then we'll do this again. We'll repeat it again three more times to mm -hmm. see if you can consistently do this to get um, luck basically out of, out of the equation and see, is this repeatable? So, um, and nobody ever won the prize, but it was very interesting because he was able to demonstrate this is how this is working. And there, I would say the vast majority, I actually I would say everybody that I saw on his show that really came to show that they're, that they had these powers, these abilities, they were shocked. And then they would but get- they don't have special powers. <laughs> Well, and then they would get mad and then they would say, oh, well, it doesn't work like that. Or I was under stress or, but you don't understand. Or, and he went over how to do cold reading. And there, there was one couple on there that um, would draw, they were supposedly, and I, I really believe that they thought this about themselves, that they were psychic and they, she would start drawing a picture and they would say, put it out to the audience. Okay. Whoever this resonates with, um, you know, let me know. I'm getting a name. I'm getting a name. It's a, it's an M. It's a, a Marge, a, a Marjorie, a something like that. Mary, Molly, Martha, and then of, of course, then it would hit, and then it was okay. Martha, okay, who is Martha? And then woman would be, would be drawing the drawing, and then they would be like, okay, well, how accurate is this? Blah blah blah. But, and it, you know, the, and here's the here's the interesting thing about the human brain is, um it's confirmation bias. And this is wow. going on through anything. <sighs> Human beings were so funny that way. You know, we want so bad to have control over our environment. And if we don't understand how to think about things logically, it's very easy to get causation and correlation confused. Yeah. You know, like back with the Salem witch trials, you know, yep. oh, the crops are dying. Okay. Well, it must be a witch. So we're gonna burn somebody. Oh, okay, the crops are still dying. Well, we need to burn another witch. And then yeah. after the fourth woman they burn or fourth warlock they burn, you know, eventually the, the, the insect infestation or whatever it is clears up, the crops come back. But now they're thinking, ah, see what we did worked. Yeah, we burned the witches. Now we have burned four back. witches, yep. the crops came back. So we have the proof, this works. Yep, and that's what, again. <laughs> yep, and that's what's so dangerous. Yeah, and Kevin is saying, talking about Yuri Geller. Uh, yeah, James Randi was big on him for, gosh, I think over 10 years. Yuri Geller was a guy back in the 70s. He was, you know, good looking. Oh, the Russian guy? Yes, and he would bend the spoons. The hands that he... <laughs> well, no, he would bend spoons. That was and his... he was bending spoon. yeah. Yeah. And, and he was on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And Johnny Carson was also a really big fan of magic. And James Randi had contacted him ahead of time and said, This guy's a fraud. Don't let him near those spoons before your show. Or it was something like, Don't let him near them or make sure you swap them out right before he goes on. It was something, cause he, you know, they're both magicians. They're like, I, we know how this works. It's true, yeah. right? But he? <laughs> yeah, and so Yuri gets up there and tries to bend one and he can't bend one on live TV. And so of course, then he comes up, I'm, you know, I'm under a lot of pressure. The camera is like, I just can't do this right now. I've, I'm very tired. And it was, you know, like over a decade later, I think Yuri came out that he, Basically, all of his stuff was a fraud, but then mm -hmm. he moved on to something else. The, the thing is, though, people's will to believe in, in this kind of, not even just psychic and mystic kind of stuff, but just in um, hope dying last is yeah. so fascinating to me because they'll even have, 
they'll even find out, okay, this is not real, but they'll still say like, okay, but can you still? Maybe it worked out for me. <laughs> they basically just lie to me, like just lie to me. And, um, but you can do the, there was a, a part in the book where Houdini, there was a, a famous actress at the time who was an amputee and she, yeah, she knew about, you know, his magic tricks and the fact that he was very, um, um, you Powerful. Know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was Houdini. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Illusions. And so she had asked him, you know, can you make my leg reappear? Roblox. Yeah. And he said he was just shocked that she would even ask him. And, and he's like, no, I, I can't. This is all an illusion. And she's like, but this is what you do. Like you do illusions. Can you just for a little bit, like make my leg look like it's back. And that's hope. That's that that drive within all of us. So uh, yeah, there was uh, some research. I forgot exactly how it went, but it showed that every human just have this never dying uh, need to just believe, to just believe, and that yeah, that's where the hope dies last. Yep. So, so I, I found this quote here mm -hmm. that he said that. Uh, <laughs> Those couple things. So even the, the rational part of me knows I was conned. The other part of me thinks I was just unlucky. And yes. that's, how, that's how many people walk away from a con, financial con. It's, it's mind blowing. And it's a crazy because I say it's mind blowing knowing very well now that I could get conned and I could have been conned already. I just don't know because the good con, you don't even know you were conned. And I, and I think that's exactly what that's, that quote speaks to is, you know, let's say if somebody had gotten tangled up with um, yeah. Bernie Madoff, you know, if he were to have said, oh, well, the stock market turned and you lost everything, odds are they would believe him and not be any the wiser realizing that no, actually he conned them out of this. And it's very easy to link up incorrect cause and effect when you're not working with all of the available information. Mm -hmm. So, and even, even so, like I had mentioned, even in my situation with dating, you know, dating two different sociopaths, the yep. first time I thought it was a fluke, like mm -hmm. this, you know, there's only like 3% of the population. It was a, a total fluke. This doesn't happen. I don't really need to watch out for this again. So I'm going to go back to my old thinking of like, I just need to love, like I've never been hurt. And I just need to trust. And all of this, this garbage advice that's passed around and then what what happens boom i fall for the next guy who was the exact same it was the love bombing and all, all of the nonsense and at that point that's when i realized okay this is now becoming a pattern what am i missing here what's going on and that's when my eyes really began to open to all of this but it's difficult it's difficult because we don't realize how driven we are by our emotions no. And um, how powerful these vulnerabilities can be. There was another really cool point she made uh, that there is not a simple study of a victim profile. There are many different examples of different profiles vulnerable to different cons. So basically what it says, we can all get triggered by different you know, aspects in life. And the good con artist he will know how to pick a victim that will work for his con. Mm -hmm. so they, and it's like they can enter the room and they know who is vulnerable in the area they need them to be vulnerable to play them. So that, that the other thing she said, and that was early at the beginning, is that we say, like she, she, she wasn't trying to make a point about whether con artists are, are narcissists or sociopath or psychopaths, but she thinks they are overlapping definitely but she made a really great point that most people who work um in a trade business the financial trading they all did she say like the high the highest percentage of them test for the machiavellian mm -hmm. personality and that they like it's it's not like three percent of them it's like many of them <laughs> so and they are usually the, the really great con artists so. Yeah. Yeah. And I think sales in general, 
right? Because in order to be effective at sales, and not to say that, I mean, not to say that all salespeople are, are snakes, but, um, you know, you become very in tune with reading other people and kind of working with your wording to get them to, to buy whatever you're selling. So real, real quick, last Miranda uh, had said, Yuri, Bell, Yuri Geller could bend spoons, but it wasn't because he had a superpower. There's a scientific explanation for it. Well, the way that James Randi explained it is that basically what they would do is they would take the spoons ahead of time and they would bend them back and forth, back and forth until between the, the neck of the spoon and the, you know, the spoon itself, there would become a crack. And so then when he would pick up the spoon, he would go like this, you know, between his fingers and it would make it look like he was warming it up or something to make it bend. Mm -hmm. But he was really just applying pressure to that crack. And then that's when it would bend enough. So it, it's, it's, pro, it's all props and it's not scientific. It's, it's trickery, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, let's see, what was I gonna? We're talking about marketers. Oh, you had mentioned oh. uh, about everybody has vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. um, you know, and con artists. This is another point, and I know I've mentioned it before, but I really, uh, you know, yes, con artists, in, any, here's the thing is anybody can pick up on the vulnerabilities of other people. We mm -hmm. all, we all, do this to some degree and it's not necessarily a bad thing it's what we do with the knowledge that we get mm -hmm. so for example i mean common people that are vulnerable are the elderly or children or teenagers in a certain sense right when they're 13 or 14 they have it, they think they've it all figured out and you realize they still are really naive but they won't listen because they think they have it all figured out <laughs> they're vulnerable in their own way um, if we've recently gone through a divorce or the death of a significant person or um, some sort of major life change, that person's vulnerable. If there's special needs, if they're, uh, I mean, you name it, everybody has some sort of vulnerabilities. They're between jobs. They lost their job. Their house is in foreclosure. All, I mean, you name it. And so I think it, the kind of common I don't know, uh, advice that's passed around is, oh, you know, these manipulative people, they can kind of sniff out, like with child predators, like, oh, they can sniff out uh, the child. But the reality is, no, it's not even that. Like they, they can, I'm sure, like you can go after, if you're have a, you know, you see 20 kids in a row, you can kind of tell, okay, here's the kid that, you know, is looking down and who's quiet and who's different. He's not as outgoing and confident as the rest of the kids. But at the same time, even those outgoing, confident, boisterous children have vulnerabilities. And if yes. a predator is interested in them, they just have to change up their approach to get them. And the reason I say this is because I think when, when people talk about, oh, you know, these manipulators, they can, they can sniff it out. It creates this sense of helplessness and fear with people of, oh, no, what do I need to do in order to stop attracting um, predators and the reality is it's it's boundaries and yeah. being also, trusting yourself to walk sorry. away I also like in, it drives me nuts when people say like oh they can just pick up on this vulnerability it's like it's they are so special they're not special like we all here's yeah. the thing everyone can be a con, con girl con man everyone we all can take advantage of other people's vulnerabilities what separates us from the con man is that we have a conscious and we are not willing to you know, intentionally place someone in a way to, you know, to take advantage of them, to, to, to go after their money. We just, we, we don't make that decision to do it. We are all capable of doing it. We would be able to do that. But from the moral point of view, we are not capable. We, we just not that kind of person. And I think that's important to, to know. They are not like super special people knowing how to place someone. No, it's, it's, we all have that skill. What's, what separates them that they don't have a consciousness and they're okay just, you know, benefiting at someone else's cost. And that's the truth. So one, one of the things, like, I thought it was a little bit bizarre that she used so many different examples of all the con, 
because I was mm-hmm. thinking it's all the same, really. It's always a carrot or a stick. <laughs> like seriously, mm-hmm. and usually the carrot. Carrot really works better. Mm-hmm. Like all of those clowns, they just like try to give people something that they really, really want. In mm-hmm. a, you know, like something they have a higher motivation to have in the moment. And that's what keeps people hooked, right? It's it's either yeah. like the pain of the threatened losses. Yep. Or it's the appeal of the perceived gain. So, oh, if you only do X, Y, and Z, you're going to, you're going to save money. You're going to get this promotion. This relationship can be saved. Your, your dead child's soul is going to go into another body. There's some sort of big carrot that that person wants. That's what keeps them on the hook is I really want this. And then the challenge is, and this is exactly what happens with abusive relationships. It's, um, you know, a person will stay in it, stay in it, stay in it. And then after a certain point, it's the whole kind of sunk cost fallacy of, well, I've been with this person, you know, for three, I don't know, three years, five years, five months, whatever it might be, this amount of time where I feel like I would be throwing this time away if I were to leave. Like my, my boss has promised me a promotion for the past year, but I'm not getting it. Well, I don't want to quit because what if that promotion someday comes? tomorrow right and yeah. what if my partner someday changes what what about that those um situations she described when people give their money to con man he lost it on the market they weren't lucky and then they proceed to give him even more money because he's so honest <laughs> well i mean it, but it makes perfect sense to us right because we we do the same in an emotional in a romantic relationship someone hurt us yeah. But we and we give them more trust that they're not gonna hurt us again. It's it's the same mechanic, which was really crazy for me because I was trying to map it on our like our experiences. And I was thinking like that in 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 those cons she describes, people are investing money, we are investing the trust, the emotion, the benefit of the doubt, and the more of the benefit of the doubt we start giving, um we are already hooked, basically. The moment you give the benefit of the doubt, you're hooked. It's like the moment that people give like yeah. $20, they are hooked. Yeah. And I think it just goes back to normal, decent people. It's just not on their radar of possibility that somebody would would do something like this. And mm-hmm. because again, this stuff's not talked about. And, you know, you look at what well, another thing that I thought was so interesting. So, you know, I again, I talk about this all the time on the live streams about how for con artists, the game is always leveling up. As soon as Mm -hmm. people catch on, the game changes. Then they catch Mm -hmm. on, the game changes. And with online things, it started off, you know, I don't know, 15 years ago, um, online, well, Nigerian prints kind of emails and, or just prints kind of emails. I'm sure there's people in Nigeria that were like, hey, no, we got these emails too from people claiming to be prints, you know. (laughs) They're from America. (laughs) Right, right, exactly, right. (laughs) Um, so yeah, just the whole, uh, I'm trapped. I need help. Uh, only you can help me and I'll send you a large sum of money for your trouble. And then it was shipping cars for a while. And then it was online dating scams and, uh, there was a pattern to it. And so once people became aware of, you know, if you're giving somebody that you've never met online money, it's a scam. Just do not do it. Don't, you've got to get rid of this idea of, but what if it's different? what if this is, you know, the fear of missing out? Like you, if the only way to prove that something's not though, if the only way for a person to prove that something's a scam is by them actually getting scammed, that's a really hard way to go through life. And um, so, but one of the things in the book that I found fascinating is she was saying that you know, a common theme with a lot of the scams, the online scams, is that the English is, it's very obviously written by somebody whose English is not their first language. And that's normally one of the first signs of just word choice is a little off, sentence structure is a little off. It it just, it reads, you know, it doesn't add up that this person's claiming to have, you know, been born in Kansas and they're in the army and they're stationed overseas, but yet their English is not their first language. And it just doesn't add up, right? And That's the same. sorry, when we're dating, it's similar. Sometimes we meet someone and it's almost like when they are, they don't sound like they're super, super smart. 
we almost like have more compassion on them. Isn't that mm -hmm. kind of similar thing? Well, kind of. I mean, I think, I, I think people that gloss over the kind of squirrely things with online stuff is, you know, it goes back to, we want to believe, we want to believe that this person who, you know, um, for a lot of people who's significantly younger, incredibly attractive, seems to really have their act together and, you know, just makes us their whole center of their world. That's very appealing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, telling us everything we want to hear kind of a thing. And so that just is very appealing. And so we're willing to kind of gloss over. A lot of it has to do with, I think people don't want to be perceived as rude. Oh, well, how, and then it's also yeah. that we, we, it goes back to the, we feeling that need of, I need concrete proof. Well, how do I know? Maybe this person just is dyslexic or maybe they, um, you know, grew up in a home where English was the second language, or mm -hmm. maybe there's all of these other explanations for this, except for what's the most obvious. And so I'm just going to keep going down this path until I have concrete proof that I know for certain that this is a scam. And, you know, and then of course it just keeps growing. Like then now the person needs, they're going to, you know, get on a plane and meet them. Oh, well that doesn't happen, but now they need money. Well, no, but how do we know? Like maybe you lots really, of people, money people. <laughs> right. Maybe yes. they really did lose their wallet. Maybe these things really yeah. did happen. Maybe they really will repay me. And it just, it, it's, denial and delusion that leads yeah. them down this road and it's sad and it's dangerous but anyways the interesting point of that was that she was saying uh instead of leveling up that i guess there was a time where scam artists had leveled up and they were using proper english in mm -hmm. these emails and on these dating sites but then they found out there were too many responses for them to filter through of potential marks yeah and so then they went back, which I, I, this stuff is just so interesting to me. So then they went back to using, um, you know, improper English, English yeah. because they realized it weeds more people out. The people that are falling for that, and they're already willing to gloss over these inconsistencies, they're the ones that they want because odds are they can pull them further down the path than the people that yeah. automatically are like, Hey, you know, this is, I'm not even going to entertain this. Like this is more likely than not a scam or um yeah so i thought that was they were easier targets um because they they had more i guess compassion from the beginning <laughs> i don't know it's weird well kind of opposite to it was when she said that the more you know about something the more vulnerable you are in this area to get conned so like the more you know about finance that actually can make you more vulnerable to get caught in the finance world. So, yeah. <laughs> so I think that kind that kind of almost um, goes along with you know us having an experience in a very busy relationship, and you know we have this experience, we have this knowledge, and we are still vulnerable to get manipulated. That's why I think so many victims go over the cycle over and over and over again. And you would think if you get once through it or twice, you should never end up in an abuser again. But we do. Yeah. Many times over. And, you know, it doesn't have to be two major big romantic relationships, but it takes many all those different uh, people in our life and repeat the same dynamic, basically, you know, in a workplace or, or, or everywhere. That, that is really interesting to me. I was trying to go somewhere with it and I forgot where I was going. <laughs> so maybe you take over. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll pick up on that. <laughs> well, one of the things that I have noticed in myself and within other people is when it comes to this, with I think with any situation in general, you know, our brain is always looking to link up cause and effect and it's mm -hmm. looking to link up what caused us pain, right? And in certain situations, it's very cut and dry. You touch a hot stove, you get burned. You've learned that lesson loud and clear, touch a hot stove, you're gonna get burned. It's different when we're interacting with people because problematic people come in all shapes and sizes and walks of life. And so 
there's so many different factors that can vary between problematic person to problematic person that it's impossible. It's just not possible for a person to be able to learn every single lesson they need to learn the first time around. Yeah. And to add to that challenge, what, what tends to happen is, so, but they're, they're linking up what they think is cause and effect. And, mm-hmm. and I know you've heard me talk about this a million times, but then it becomes, oh, well, I'm never going to, um, you know, uh, I'm going to avoid all Scorpios. I'm going to avoid all redheads. I'm going to avoid older men. I'm going to avoid whatever the, the most obvious things about this person were and thinking that that'll keep us safe. And this is just faulty thinking that we're that subconscious. They're not, we're not even really aware that we're doing. Yeah. And, and so then down, you know, in time, when a person gets generally burned a few more times and a few different relationships, the challenge with that is then they can really start linking up and correct cause and effect and thinking, I must be cursed. God hates me. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, or just start thinking in extremes. Well, just all, I'm, I'm never going to do Yeah. yeah. Um, these kinds of things. And um you know, I've seen a lot of women that have sworn off dating men and that have gone to dating women. Yeah. And be shocked and horrified that they get tangled up with a female abuser. And because it's, it's the behavior, it's not the gender or the sexual orientation or the religion or anything else. None of it's that. Behavior. Yeah. And it's. You reminded me what I wanted to, what I wanted to go with it. So she didn't spend much time uh, on it in the book, which I thought that was very disappointing to me Uh because she describes all the con dynamics and everything and then she just gives you like maybe half of the chapter about how to avoid being conned at the very end of the book (laughs) and I was like seriously Uh (laughs) we need more of that knowledge but I guess um I guess she made a point with that too in a in a way because like what you were just saying, you know, trying to just like recognize the common is not a way. Trying to recognize the dynamic of the con game, that's the way. So it's the same with the abuse, abusers. Like you can't just like go and say, oh, abuser, abuser, I'm not going to date any more abusers. And abuser look like this, talk like that, yeah. da, da, da. You, you have to be able to recognize in a cognitive and emotional way the dynamic the cycle of the abuse that you can be pulled in and say, you know, tell that for what's happening. Like, you know, the love bombing. So you need to be able to recognize that or the valuation right away if it happens first time already to walk away. And it, it's it's the same here. And I was thinking that um, the, the other way, like you cannot, and I think she says that a little bit. She makes the point that you really... I'm not sure if she makes that point or the other book I'm reading, so I apologize, but it's valid. I think it applies. She makes a point or someone else is makes the point that you have to know yourself really well to not to be calmed. Like and you need to be, sorry, you need to be very emotionally mature. Well, I, yes, but I think a lot of it has to do with, you've really got to be grounded within your boundary standards and deal breakers. Yeah, because but that's we all think we all think we're yeah. emotionally mature. I mean, that's the problem is is we can't because we all think that it would never happen to us. Um, it's so you important. Know, but saying I'm emotionally mature doesn't make me emotionally mature. Having boundaries makes you emotionally well, mature. Yes, <laughs> yes I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> but I think that's that's the difference because I don't think a lot of people connect that. Yeah. Right? So uh, most people are like, no, I'm very emotionally mature. I'm very aware of my feelings. I'm able to express them moderately. Like I'm emotionally mature, but in also healthy boundaries, because that, I mean, I know I'm preaching to the choir because we've had so many conversations about this, but boundaries. Uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's uh, never enough because people don't practice it. Yeah. Well, and I don't think that it's clear enough that they even know what to practice. That's a hard thing because society is so dysfunctional. There's mm-hmm. so many, so much that well-intended bad advice out there that, you know, a person's got to wade through all that. And it's difficult for any of us, you know, if you're in a room full of people and you feel like something's off and you're uncomfortable with somebody, but everybody around you, you know, including your therapist is like, well, 
I think that's a really great guy. I think you're afraid of commitment. I think that you're, you know, you're afraid of being hurt, blah, blah. And then it creates all of this self doubt. And then we end up, it's very easy for a person to slip into doing what we think we should do. And this is why we were talking about people tend to get in the cycle of being in multiple um, abusive relationships. That's part of it. And so then when they start feeling like, I don't know, is it me or is it them? I feel like something's off. I feel like something's uncomfortable. I don't know. Am I hypervigilant? Do I have issues with, with commitment or with men or with women? There's or no women? boundaries already out there. If you don't know if it's me or if it's them, that means there's no boundary implied at all. Because if you have a boundary, you know if it's you or if it's them. You just know. Well, I think, I think where people get confused with that, it's more of they're experiencing more like covert manipulation it's, it's the blaming, it's the invalidation, it's the minimization, it's somebody saying, there's nothing wrong here, you're too sensitive, you have issues, you're, you're too emotional, and then they're starting That's to- That's boundary violation, you're violating my boundaries, telling yeah. me what, so this is the dynamic we can, like, show, this is how boundary works, if someone's telling you, oh, you shouldn't feel like that, they're violating your boundaries, because the way you feel is the way you feel, no one can tell you how to feel. Yes. No one can tell you how to think. This is all validation of boundaries. Yep. And yep. I think that's that's where people have to go all the way to the ba- basic. If you feel like if if you feel something is off, something is off. You don't you, you don't need one more person to agree with you. It's off for you. And you just have to I, yes. I think I think I was really exploring it lately because I was wondering why do I still sometimes like kind of sweep under the carpet some of the like and i'm not even saying about red flags i can pick up like orange bl- flags like little light red orange whatever <laughs> like seriously but i kind of sweep them under the carpet sometimes when i talk with someone and i was wondering why and i thought it's because i see it but i pretend i don't see it because i'm kind of entertained but at the same time i'm i'm kind of like i'm violating my own boundary and I have to be responsible for that because I'm yes. violating my own boundary of being safe and of trusting myself and doing what I know what to do. And if I pretend I don't see something, I'm lying to myself. And then I know myself as less trustworthy person. And the more, the more I see myself as less trustworthy, the more I will be ignoring my own feelings because I cannot be trusted. So my right. instinct cannot be trusted then, right? We're going off the topic over here. Sorry. No, no, I think that's that's important. I think it's really on topic because that's really what it is. And it's, you know, avoiding problematic people. There's the top down approach and then there's the bottom up approach. And the top down approach is to really look at, to examine all of these different various red flags. But that's, that'll only keep a person so safe because they they come in a wide range of, of walks of life mm-hmm. so it's more about knowing ourself it's less about figuring out other people it's more about that bottom up figuring out ourself and if something does not sit well with you that's it that's all you need and mm-hmm. it, if it doesn't work for you it doesn't work for you so it's not about figuring out another person's intention yeah. um, but it really does help it, I think information more, well I think the more yeah the more a person learns about just manipulation and the information about more of these subtle forms, um, you know, the more I can help. Sorry. I'm kind of glad this book is about con games, not manipulation, narcissistic abuse, because it kind of puts a little bit distance for most of us because it's about money, not emotion. Even though I believe that lots of survivors were really taken for their money. And, and, you know, they suffer because of the financial abuse and all that. So, you know, I'm, I'm not minimizing it here, but it's like, for me, it kind of let me see, you know, the whole just dynamic without uh, triggering me that much. Mm-hmm. So that was an easier, easier read. It's some, like, if that was like about uh, eating disorders, it wouldn't be such a easy read for me because it's still emotionally eating, right? So there'll be something triggering me and I would not want to see it, right? But this was like something that I think, oh, we talked about it before that I got burned as a very young person borrowing someone money. And that was so harmful to me at the time because I was like very, I was 20 years old, I think. So, and I lost so much money. There was so much consequences, you know, and also some of my family. 
And that's why I like, I'm not going to say like, I'm not vulnerable in a financial way, but I think twice, thrice, and I, I've never had like, I just don't lend people money if I, you know, if I know that they would not give me money back and stuff like that. Uh, but anyway, it was easy for me to read this book. So I could really focus on all the dynamic. And I think that's priceless because we do need to make a connect. You have to integrate the information. So we have to go from both ways. Like you say, the bottom up and the, the from the up down. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what it connects. That's why people spend yes. so much time trying to understand all the abuse mechanics. So we have to know that. But you can have all the knowledge, all the information. If you don't start using it as you and really trusting your discernment. Because here's the thing. If you, I promise, I think I want to really speak to every survivors in this chat room today. Like, I promise you, you already know enough. You already have enough information. You do. If you watch maybe five of Dana's videos or you, you were participated in like maybe three or four, you know, live streams, you probably already know at least 90% of what you need to know to use to, to, to be safe, to be able to, you know, just trust yourself. One of the things, yeah. One of the things I've noticed with people and, you know, again, I was there too, but they put all this pressure on themselves to be able to kind of root out if a person's uh, abusive right away. And so they have to do that. Right, right, exactly. They're putting all this pressure on themselves. They're like, well, okay, but but this person said this, but like, is this a problem? Is this what they meant? And I and I get it because it's that fear of I don't want to be blindsided by this again. And um when I see people posting, like, here's some screenshots of text, like, is this a problem? Is this normal? I don't know. That's the stage in healing when people are really kind of figuring out where their line is for comfort. Mm-hmm. Um but it helps, we, we've really got to be able to know when we've basically, when we've been disrespected and mm-hmm. then what to do about it. And we've got to be able to have a line in the sand of when we walk away. Because some people here in the, the chat, they were asking, well, how do you know the difference you know, between um, you know, uh, real red flags and, and CPTSD hypervigilance? And I will tell you, not, my experience has been like 9.9 out of 10 times when yeah. people say, oh, I'm just being hypervigilant, there's a legitimate problem there. And then yeah. you dig a little deeper and then, oh, no, actually, um, you know, their significant other had lied about, you know, the number of children they had or they had yelled at them. One lady was saying um, she'd gotten in her fight with, with a guy and he threw a, a glass of water in her face. And, you know, stuff like this. And it's like, nope, these are the signs. Like, this isn't you being hypervigilant. This is all a problem. And so it's, we've got to be able to be in tune with what is actually a problem. And that's such a hard thing for so many survivors, especially if this is all they've known or if this is how they grew up, because what is extreme problematic behavior is, doesn't register Uh that bad to them because they've known Uh worse. You know, it's like, well, this, this person might yell, but at least they don't hit. Yeah. That's that's the worst part. Or this person might cheat, but at least they don't yell. Well, one of the things she says at the end of the book to avoid the con, and I think that's really applies uh, here, you need to write on a piece of paper, like almost like a rules of engagement, how far you can go, what's okay, what's not okay. Like she, she, like you have to have actually a physical copy of, like if you don't have great boundaries, like just like on you, like put it on a piece of paper and have like make points and then also you you want to have someone you can be accountable to and that's the same thing you can do inside of the dating like Mm -hmm. i date and i talk about you and dandelion and you know a couple other people that in my in my actual life that know me that i have to be honest with because even like even if i attempt not to be honest with myself like i want to be honest with my friends Mm -hmm. right so it's good to have that kind of accountability in your life. And you're right. I don't have to figure out right away if someone is abusive or not. I just have to take slow, take yeah. it slow. And don't stop anything I'm doing in my life. Like, and I've, I don't do that. But I remember like two years ago, I would stop. If I met someone, I would like so focus on figuring out if they are the right person, if they're healthy, 
I would drive myself crazy. It was ridiculous. It was just like, oh God, it was just like slide down. And then I ended up in a desperation when I find out they are not okay for me. Like they are not yeah. healthy. And then I ended up feeling even worse about myself. And my life looked worse because that time I focused on trying to figure them out. I slide back in my life, not working on my art, not working my business. Just, I mean, like I still want to work, right? But like, you know, you're kind of like lame. <laughs> so, and I did that. Yep. And I think it's all part of the process. We all gonna go through that. But once you start seeing it, here's, here is what helped me. And I, and I think maybe this is why I'm sometimes tougher when I speak to people because I, I'm gonna kind of do this tough love but like in a generous good way like I don't want to be like harsh never I, I never want to be harsh I promise but like I'm I, I, I decided that I need to be kind of like tough on myself like I need to be a grow up an adult and be responsible and I need to start respecting myself like a grow up woman like that was like for me a really step up because I had to behave as someone that respects herself. Yes. And I, we're missing that. This, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, it's hard for us to do it because we have shame and we have so, and you know, I had so much shame. So it's hard for me to respect myself with all that shame in me, but I can respect myself even though I'm ashamed of different things I did. I still can respect myself because making mistakes or like, you know, being a part of a mistake. I don't, I, you know, I don't want to talk about shame right now, but like I still deserve respect as a human being. So. Yes. Yeah. And I think that the reality is even, it, it's not going to work. Like there's nothing there. If somebody doesn't treat us with respect, it's not like we're settling and that this can somehow work. It, it's not, it's just going to drag you through hell. And I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, I think it's a lot easier to walk away from these kinds of situations when you realize you're, you're not walking away from anything that's ever going to be good. If this person is really treating you terribly, th you're, there's no loss. It's a win on your end, not a loss. And but back to what you were saying, the the um, being more of that adult in this situation, there was a I'm sure. I think Pia Melody has talked about this, but there's been a few people that have talked about this. Um, but the difference between being like in the, um, you know, stepping into that adult space versus acting as the wounded child, you know, and the difference is profound. And so when we can really take a step back and see who is steering the ship here, because because it's the wounded child that says, well, but I, I don't want it in this relationship. I love, I love this person. I love them so much and, <laughs> and I need them and I can't be alone. I can't do this. And, and, you know, I'm just so scared and all of that's totally valid and understandable, but that is the wounded child. Whereas yeah. the healthy adult self, when this healthy adult self is steering the ship, it's more of a, you know what? I'm really profoundly hurt. I really cared about this person. I cared about this relationship, but just because you love someone isn't a valid reason to stay in a relationship. Like there needs to be that foundation of dignity and respect and honesty and openness and all, all of these things there. And, and it can help. So I think, especially when we're caught up in manipulation, mm -hmm. paying attention to the thoughts that are going through our head, is it that attitude of scarcity of I need to act now and I need to do this and I'm so scared I'm going to lose this person. And what if there's, you know, this is the only person and, all of that, like that's not the adult thinking or yeah. the adult driving the ship, you know? Well, it's, it's great you said that because I feel that when I'm dating now, I'm not looking for love. I'm really looking for respect. Mm. And it's like, because I think love has been so washed out of the meaning that I don't even want to say that most of the time. Like, I rather like I only say saying I love you for people that I truly love, respect, and and value in my life. So, like even when I like someone, it's like people start saying like I like you a lot now, which is kind of cool. But also they say it in a like lovey way, which is ridiculous. It's just like trying to like not to raise a red flag. I guess I don't know. <laughs> Sweet. Mm -hmm. But I, I I think it's good to like don't look 
like okay so when when i can see myself looking for that attention and affection i am operating from the wounded child i see it and then i can switch into okay we are not in you know we are not dating so someone gives us attention because if i need attention i can give myself attention Mm -hmm. I can spend the whole day giving myself attention in a very positive, nourishing way. I can go to my friends and say, hey, let's go do something together because I need attention. And, you know, so I don't need to be vulnerable about that. But, you know, like I can switch to being an adult and say, you know what? This is not about you liking me and just focusing on me. This is about respecting partnership, Mm -hmm. honest, authentic communication. And that's what I'm looking for. And I don't know how we are in this conversation out of the con game. (laughs) But I kind of like this conversation more. I think it's... (laughs) I think it's absolutely related because it's it's that wounded child that tends to get caught up with manipulators because they're feeding that vulnerability, right? Yeah. And that's why we're glossing over so many of these red flags. Like here, here's another example. Because um, last Miranda was, you know, yeah, it's you're right about that. We might not. It's that feeling of we might not have enough information and acting upon the information that we have is the real problem. Yes. When when I was in college for my bachelor's degree, I did a semester abroad in Italy, and um, I had never come across con artists, um, but they're all over Italy, and they're probably in a lot of places in Europe, but they're a huge amount in pickpockets and all kinds of stuff, and um, there were quite a few people in my class that lost jewelry, their wallet, their passport, like all, all kinds of stuff. And, you know, and at first, cause it was more of our kind of culture thinking, well, I don't want to be rude. And of course they were relying on that. Right. And so very quickly, it got to the point where I was like, you know what, I can't care if you think that I'm rude or not. If anybody comes up behind me, if they bump into me, if they start talking to me, if they're trying to get me alone, if they come over and sit down, then it's like, you just got to go away. I don't know who you are. I don't want to know who you are. Like, I can't, like the odds of this not ending well are too high for me to, you know, to just throw caution to the wind, but that's such an uncomfortable thing for us to do because we think, oh, but especially with dating, well, what if this is the one? And what if I'm missing out on this great person? And I just don't want to live my life in fear and this, that, and the other. But it's like, you have to err on the side of caution um, and just don't do what's uncomfortable, you know? Um, And I guess to know when something is a potential danger, I think a lot of people just, you know, don't know well so. there was it's i think it's important to start getting in tune with your feelings because if you don't know if you are anxious just because something makes you nervous but you are anxious because you're picking up something dangerous to you that's a problem and i did struggle with this problem because everything occurred to me like a danger at the very beginning because you know we are all like what is it like the adrenaline override whatever it is but like we are hypervigilant first. We are. Mm-hmm. So it takes time for us to calm down. But then, you know, you might see that, you know, in a, it's almost like you need to tell your brain what is the difference between danger and just nervousness because you're doing something new. And your brain will be able to pick on that difference and remember it because you have a smart brain. Our brain is super duper smart. It's like, this amazing thing over here. It's little tiny, but it's awesome and, and really remember stuff. So like how you can do that is, you know, go and actually do something new you've never done before. Like I recently went to the beach with my daughter and she, she said, mom, you're going to do the zip line with me. And, you know, there was some kind of limited amount of danger in it like risk but it was a risk not like something can I didn't think there was something really could happen to me but there was always some risk but the way I felt about it and the way I feel so I kind of like tell myself okay this is how being anxious and nervous about risking something feels but in a fun way Mm -hmm. like and you kind of like you really want to feel it and I swear I was standing up there hugging the thing and I said I don't think I can do that (laughs) 
that's the thing. I did it twice. It was fun, actually. But like mm-hmm. once you do it, like, and you kind of feel it, it teaches you something. So you do, you, and, and I think here is, here is, here is why we struggle with it. Because most of that, most of us had not nourishing childhoods. We were not to- told that. Mm-hmm. Because usually when you have parents or grandparents or aunt, whatever, someone that is helping you and guiding you through different experiences, they will teach you like, oh, yes, that was dangerous. Like you feel that, let's say when you cross the, the road and the car drives, that's danger. You feel that's danger. That's not mm-hmm. just anxiety that something bad can happen. Something bad can actually happen. So right. they can do that. They can freaking teach you that. We, have, we weren't taught like this. So now you need to create an opportunity for yourself in your adult life to teach yourself the difference between how danger feels and how anxiety feels. Don't put yourself in a dangerous situation. Though. <laughs> I mean, yeah. in the controlled way, right? You can. <laughs> well, and I, I would say another way you can kind of cross check this is to ask yourself, like, what is what I'm doing? Is, is this is this like a judge Judy episode in the making, right? If it is, then something needs to be adjusted because Mm -hmm. we will all see it's so much easier for us to see this stuff in other people. But yeah, is this, is this have the potential to be on judge Judy? You know, am I loaning money to somebody I don't know, or that I know I can't trust? Am I, Mm -hmm. do you know, is, is there no contract that's drawn up? Like, is this, does this have the potential to go South? And if so, what can I do in order to make sure that it's um, as avoidable as possible? A lot of these things are very avoidable. So, uh, so you know, is this a Judge Judy episode in the making? And, or is this a Dateline episode in the making, mm-hmm. right? Is this like a To Catch a Predator or, you mm-hmm. know, somebody goes missing? These kind of, if it's a Dateline she episode does. in the making, you need to run. Like she does, right? Yeah. Don't make money at people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, right. Yeah. I mean, is this is, is is this a story that you would see like the beginning stages that you would see on Dateline yeah. or on Judge Judy? This is these are bad decisions. And so something needs to be done early as possible. Um, because, again, this book and she talks about it like, you know, we all think that we're the exception. No, and, we're not. And we're not. So yeah. it's really important that people just err on the side of caution. I, you know, I see this time and again and in. The support group people are like oh you know my you know <laughs> my manipulative selfish verbally abusive you know self-centered cheating ex um doesn't want to go to court he wants to do the divorce just me and him and that he promises he'll pay child support what should i do things like that and it's like you, you have this long-standing pattern with this person who shows that he has no wow. he or she has no respect for you has no intention of having respect for you and has had control over you and who thinks you're the problem, they're not going to start acting appropriate now. So this is the fantasy we have because we're fearing this confrontation. And instead of seeing their behavior clearly, and we've got to be able to respond. It's, it's that wounded child, you know, that we don't, and I get it because people like that are scary, you know? Um, But really thinking like, what is the most adult thing to do in this situation? And then doing that. Oh, if you cannot go that far, just what is the most respectful things for you to do for yourself? Respectful. I like that. Yeah. Yep. Cause like, I like to start small with stuff like this. Like everything is like, I, I find out that if I put like too big of a steps on myself, it's too much pressure. And I kind of like sabotage my, my success. So it's better to, you know, pick those small little things first and just get good at those little things. Yeah. And I guess that's the cool thing about it is this is all skill, like this level of discernment and awareness and judgment. It's, it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight and it's a lot of stumbling and falling. Mm -hmm. And it's so important for us to keep, um, I think, keep perspective and realize, you know what, you don't just start walking perfect. You don't just start running, right? You don't just, no. you don't just sit down and play the piano. Like it, there's practice that's involved before anybody gets good at any skill and setting boundaries and cultivating this level of discernment is definitely one of those things. And to, to be compassionate and loving with ourselves as we're going through the process, you know, so important. So, 
I want to go back to the book because there was one thing I remember that I, w- I wanted to ask you about. What did you think about this woman who left her husband and then she was found as homeless, beaten uh, in, I don't know, Norway or Sweden somewhere or Ireland, I don't know. And she was pretending that she was a sex trafficking victim and she didn't speak because she pretended she didn't speak English and she was only drawing. And then she ended up in the news, national news, and her husband from Australia recognized her or something. I was like, what was the point? I was like, was that like borderline kind of thing? What did you think? I, when I read that, I found it was really odd that trauma specialists couldn't see through the manipulation because if you've been in the field for any length of time, you've come across people like this that pretend all kinds of things. And there's certain patterns of behavior that's, that you know, if a person has schizophrenia, if a person's been a victim of some sort of crime, like this tends to be a certain way that they behave. Um, And I just don't think it would take a true trauma professional more than five minutes in a room with somebody like that. She was also pretending she's a teenager when she was like 40 or something like that. I was actually like 25 or something. 25. Yeah. I was like, what? What? Like, I was thinking like she, how yeah. could she fool all the medical professionals, trauma, police, the law enforcement? It was just unbelievable. You know, part of me thinks, I, I guess I could see it. If you have people that are fairly new to the profession, you know, when I was working in mental health but, and, it, you know, it's only one of every... I don't know, thousand people that you would get in that would pull something like that. You know, we had people that would come in trying to get on disability and they'd say that, oh, they're schizophrenic, right? And they would act the part of what they thought a schizophrenic person would act like. And if you- I don't know. I think it's, I think actually they could be experts because remember the woman that was convincing me I have uh, the dissociative personality disorder? Mm -hmm. She was an expert on that one. So she wanted to see it everywhere. And I think this could be the same case when people who have more knowledge about something, they are more vulnerable to be conned in that knowledge, in that field. So I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think, there's, I think there's a couple of different things going on, but like when a person is, but like the, my whole example with people that are acting like they have schizophrenia, the yeah. people that were new, like the brand new counselors, the brand new nurses, yeah. the brand new psychiatrists would take them at face value because mm-hmm. it's just not on a normal person's radar to think, oh, somebody's actually going to come in here and put on this whole performance and actually want to get injections every two weeks or every month just to get you know, a disability check. And it's like, oh no, hang on to your hat. There's all kinds of games that are being run around here by people. So it just takes a while for a person to kind of catch on to the different ways that people try to manipulate the system. But I guess with her situation, she was also something like 88 pounds. She was incredibly malnourished. So I think because of her physical presentation, I could see how they would, they might think there's got to be some sort of truth. They didn't want to question her too much because she Mm -hmm. was so malnourished that it was like something had happened. But um, yeah, that was speak English. I think I think she she probably was able to successfully lie her way, you know, through it because she wasn't speaking really. Yeah, she was communicating to drawing. I I think that was yeah. Because I think now there there was another thing in the book, and I think this is it's good to mention that that there was no like we have all those things how to tell that someone's lying, but those are universally not true everywhere. It's like we, it's like a myth. We all keep up the same myth of how to recognize someone is lying, but none of it is accurate. None of it. Yes, that's, that was a very valid point that everybody in these different surveys had really overrated their ability to be able to discern yeah. truthfulness and all that. And I'm not saying that I would be able just in a normal conversation, but I think it's like anybody in any profession, you know, like for, for example, you know, if you're an architect, and you're talking to somebody else that says that they're an architect, you're going to expect that they're going to know certain terminology. There's going to be certain jargon within that industry. They're, they're going to have the knowledge of an architect. And 
you know, you wouldn't expect them to say stuff like, well, you know, like the stuff inside the walls that keeps the house warm or, uh, do you know what I mean? They wouldn't have rudimentary understanding. But then, but then we have a guy who performed 19 surgery. <laughs> well, okay. So that, but that's something else too, because there's more than one way to, to obtain knowledge. I think there are certain people that are just able have knowledge. knowledge just because that guy didn't go to college to be mm-hmm. a, a medical doctor doesn't mean that he's not qualified. It just means he doesn't have a degree in medicine. So, um, you know, there's more than one way to learn a skill. This um, always gets me. And I mean, if you have s- such a like skilled, wonderful brain that you can learn so much, why are you doing it for bad purposes? I mean, like, because they, they, they spend, they, they, you know, some of the comments, they actually study something memory stuff, learn even new language just to be successful under con game. Well, like, probably a lot of it's instant gratification, right? They mm-hmm. don't want to go back to college for eight years and, you know, get a degree in something. And it's just easier. I mean, especially nowadays with the internet, right? Like anybody mm-hmm. can say that there's anything on the internet. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm a, I'm a neurosurgeon. Prove me wrong. No. YouTube is filled with lots of people who pretend they're such a great psychologist, yes. life coaches for, and they, they, so one, one thing I, I, I think I'm going to say, cause I don't, you know, I, I'm not a life coach, none of that. I'm just an artist and I'm like, you know, but like okay. you have to be don't careful. Don't say names. Don't say no, names. I'm not saying names, okay. but be careful who you listen to because some people can take advantage of your experience of trauma. They can, and you know, if someone is offering you some life coaching and it's so much money, don't, don't spend money, please, because you can find so much stuff for free. Don't spend money on your, you know, on that, please. I mean, consider, think twice, thrice, I don't know how many times. Or do it, or if you're going to do it, do it through PayPal. Somebody that's going to have your back, you're going to be able to get your money back if it's damaging or not legit. But um, what were we talking about before this, the... Oh, people putting on an act that, that, yeah. um, um, people acting the part. Yeah. I don't, I don't, you know, it's almost like from my experience of knowing couple, like co- of overt narcissists, mm-hmm. it's almost like they don't need someone else's to value their professionalness. They are good enough to say they are the expert. Well, and they're arrogant enough and and ignorant enough to think that they're fooling other people. And there's, that's what's so interesting is they just make up these credentials and they, they think, they think that they understand the jargon, just like the person coming into my office and go, Oh, I'm, you know, acting the part of a schizophrenic. They, they think that they're really convincing. And really everybody that's in the know is just laughing. Like, this is so offensive. Like, what are you doing? You know, I wish I could record this because it's a joke because they don't realize that the, the certain way things are phrased or a terminology because they're not actually in that industry. They've maybe read a ton of books, but they're still missing key pieces of. It's like trying to be, be crime scene investigator just by watching CSI Miami. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Seriously. Yeah. You know, my whole thing is, um, I think it's just important for people to Google people and just err on the side of caution, protect yourself. Think about, you know, does this have the makings of being on judge Judy? And if so, how can I take a different action to better protect myself? Um, Yeah. And it's like Google, I think, I think you should just put it as something you do. Just Google, check background right away. Don't wait for when something doesn't feel right. Just like Google. Cause I think that's what I'm going to be doing just from the beginning. It uh-huh. really just makes sense, you know, because because when the moment you start talking to someone and you like them, you will postpone it because then some emotions will be at play, some kind of attractions, I think. And I think it's really just good to, hey, I want to talk with this person. Let me see if so far what's on his profiles would match, you know, I, I can find a match for that on the internet. It's good to do that, I think, when you're still like just like thinking 
only, not feeling anything yet. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, what was I gonna shoot? I keep thinking of stuff and then I keep forgetting it. My brain, my little hamster on the wheel just keeps falling off. Um, <laughs> gosh. Getting clowned. <laughs> oh man. Um, well, I guess, I guess I, this is not what I wanted to say, but this is kind of what I'm thinking about um, is my book, my third book, The Narcissist's Playbook is what it's yeah. called. You can find all my books under Dana Morningstar across the internet. Um, that book, ta- it's all about manipulation. So that's why I was thinking, last Miranda was asking, does this help you identify con artists and such? That book is all about like what manipulation is, what manipulation isn't, how to spot it in like the early stages, how to respond to it when it does kick up and the whole process of getting really centered within yourself Mm -hmm. to make, to become less of a target. So even if you do wind up in a room and you're being targeted by manipulators, that you're going to be more solid in this is what's okay with me. This is what's not okay with me. And Mm -hmm. you're just a lot less of a target. So um, and then again, just as a reminder, these books, you can ask your local library to carry them, even like with my audio books, if budget is a concern, um, you can go to, what is, what did I say? Audibletrial.com slash thrive after abuse. If you sign up, you can get a free audio book, but mm-hmm. local libraries are still a thing and it's, mm-hmm. they I'm can really that, sorry, get you stuff. That we, you know, we are all a target because that's true. So since we are all a target, let's not be an easy target. Because, yep, it's really just about being empowered and being educated. Yeah, it really yeah. is. Because this and kind of know, stuff can happen to anybody. And and trying to make that shift from, um, you know, from just having the knowledge and you know focusing on getting more, trying to make us you know small shifts into like using that knowledge you have, so you can, you know, I'm a big fan of like doing your own personal experiments like really like you know just try how something works for you how something feels for you and i think that's the way you can learn so much so like you take a one bit of the knowledge you already have and and try it in a field be like little field investigator Mm -hmm. or something like that little field agent of the day (laughs) so Mm -hmm. have fun with that yeah practicing these skills in a safe way you know you guys have heard me talk about the website meetup.com. I'm a huge fan. I think it's a great way to get kind of reconnected back into life and hobbies and meeting new people. It's not a dating site. Crazy people too. I met someone crazy. Well, the well, it's, it's, it's the general public, right? <laughs> yes. So, but that's, this is the point. So this is, an, this is a time where you can practice these skills and you're sharpen your level of discernment in just about the safest way possible because you are in control you can go to I encourage people to sign up for a dozen different yep. ones and start going to them realize you can leave at any time and you set the pace you know and you'll start in time and sometimes it takes some time it might take you know a few months to really see a person's behavior where you're like you yeah, know that does, that's not okay with me I need mm-hmm. that's not what I want in my life and mm-hmm. and that's okay Mm -hmm. It still takes me, there's times, it still takes me several months sometimes to really see um, problematic behavior clearly. So it's, yeah, don't be so hard on yourself, you know? Yeah, Uh, I think it's hard to see if if a behavior is problematic, if it doesn't bother us quickly, because it's not in the area that we are really vulnerable about. Yeah, or if we are thinking, you know, like you mentioned earlier, it's so easy, you know, for a person when um, they've learned, they're really getting into narcissistic abuse and verbal and emotional abuse and understanding manipulation and all of this. It's very easy for us to second guess ourselves, especially when we want reality to be something different than it is to think, oh, and and because it's very common for you to have friends and family be like, mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with this person. You've just been researching it. You're just sensitive because of your past or what have you. And this is another reason, like you were saying, people that know more tend to get caught up in this. Yeah. When I was in mental health, I knew so many people that had gotten tangled up with sociopaths. And 
Um, and, and then you exact, did. <laughs> and it, well, and it was exactly, it was because yes. they kind of thought, you know what, I'm psycho analyzing people. I'm reading too much into this. I'm bringing, you know, like mm -hmm. I'm not, this, I'm not seeing things clearly because I work the vast majority of my patients are, have some real major challenges in life, or there's a lot of sociopaths or manipulative mm -hmm. people. And I'm seeing stuff where it's not there. And then of course it turns out, no, actually that's really there. So it's easy for us to second guess ourselves, and it just takes time to kind of sharpen that saw and that's okay. So you know? how, how would you describe to someone, how does it feel to trust yourself? You feel calm, you feel comfortable, you feel secure, you feel like when you feel in control, um, you feel strong, you feel like how you are when you're around a good friend, uh, that, that you know if something's not right for you, I guess you just, you feel in charge. Like if something's not right for you, you realize, hey, if this, I can say something or I can leave. And uh, I set the pace and I don't need anybody else to agree with me. If something or someone is making me uncomfortable, I don't need to ask other people for validation. I know I just don't do things that make me uncomfortable because why? There's no point. So well, I need- Well, not really, because I'm, 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 I'm an artist. So for me, certain things to do, I need to go out of my comfort zone and actually get uncomfortable with something in order to accept to the next level. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and then I also need to trust myself to be able to do that, but that doesn't always feel peaceful. I think <laughs> That's you why can, I ask you that. Well, I'm I think it's, it's within minimized, it's minimizing risk, right? So, I mean, experimenting, uh, you know, experimenting with paint colors is one thing where where is the risk where is the reward well the risk is for example investing six hundred dollars to rent a space gallery space in a town and then am i gonna sell enough am i not gonna sell enough well but i think there's ways around that that you can really you know mitigate that risk like for me, it would be like, okay, if I'm not, if I'm losing sleep over this, then what do I need to do in order to feel comfortable with that step? Well, for me, I would need at least um, probably a year's worth of studio rent in the bank. I would need at least six months of my own bill money in savings. Um, and then I love you saying that because that's what I was trying to go to. Like sometimes it's, it, it cannot be only emotional thing. It has to be. Yeah. A, a preparation like you have to be responsible for for doing things and yes you don't just trust in your emotion like oh i can keep cool whatever you also need to trust yourself to do the right things in a moment to make things happen that are good to you so basically it's like trusting myself it will be like i'm not trusting myself just like feel good about myself but i'm trusting myself to do things that are nourishing and good to me Yes. And it, cause it's the adult that's steering that ship. Right. So it does this, like you said, you know, basically is this respecting myself and does this make sense? And like, here's another example. You, you guys probably know Agatha and I are writing a book together. We're also, <laughs> Good laugh. God. yeah, it's been, it's been quite the process, but, um, you know, and we are friends. I trust her completely. And I, I hope that she feels the same way about me. I've known her for a while. We're still going to draw up a contract. We're still going to do everything. Like, does this have the potential to be a Judge Judy episode? How can we mitigate that? How can we make this to where it's not just based on a handshake? It's based on this is what happened. Because the, the adult. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like, well, okay. Then what happens if I, you know, get hit by a bus tomorrow? Now it's in public too. So now we have to really do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I mean, we are, we are. But, but it like, was from the beginning. We were like communicating via email. So things are in writing and we, we, we know there is an evidence yeah. of the whole process. Yeah. Yeah. That was yeah. one of the things we did just for that reason. Yeah. And, and it wasn't even just for finances. I think our concern yeah. was more of we're friends. We want to stay friends after this. It's easy yeah. for people to have two different recollections of how, what was said. 
and to protect our friendship, we really need to do this as by the book as possible. You know, so if there's any question, we can just go back and say, okay, roll, roll the tape, <laughs> you know, or like, yeah, that's so true. That is so true because yeah. I really, I remember that when we, we started talking about it, I was, I was coming from the place, whatever happens professionally, I don't want it to impact our friendship. Yeah. And those are two different words. And then also like, sometimes we have conversation about, you know, your profession, like your, 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 you know, what you are doing there, the YouTube, the support group. And also that is like another kind of contract we have unspoken when, you know, sometimes I can give you unsolicited advice and apologize for it. <laughs> <laughs> but we kind of figure it out. So it's, it's really important to, I guess, trust each other that we both will uphold the space of solution oriented communication which i love when you say that like i just I, i'm stealing it from you each time i'm saying it i know thank you yeah. like it's important to have that we have to trust each other to have that and it cannot be only on a good day when i like you right like when i feel like i like you. i mean i like you all the time but there was there's days there's, there's moments <laughs> yeah, we're upset with each other sometimes, but we don't argue. But we are upset. I'm like, I'm frustrated. She's not doing it. She's doing something else. And then mm-hmm. when you can do it, I cannot do it. I'm doing something else, right? So we have some frustration. We have upset. Mm-hmm. And it's important. Like, so trusting, knowing yourself as someone you can trust to make good, ju- you know, based on good judgment decision is important and then more like you will know yourself as someone like this when you're operating in that I, i'm a respectful and respecting myself adult because it's a child that is upset one day and a happy one day upset and happy one day and act however they feel so i, I read something brilliant today in a different book which i think we should all read that emotional spiritual um, spiritual emotional health something like that who and, who is it by uh peter cesaro Okay. Is there something else? I think it would be great for us to read it on a book club because it, it, it shows so much negative things from Christianity that are misunderstood and how most of Christians are emo- emotionally Im- immature and they pretend are spiritually mature and that cannot happen together. Mm. Like if you are emotionally mature, you are spiritually mature. Just yeah. that's the way it is. There's no other way around. But anyway, he said brilliant thing. I, I screenshot it today to, that, today to you and send it to you. When he said, we all are born like narcissists almost because we're all about me, 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 me. I want, I want, I want. I feel like it. I don't feel like it. Like me, me. And the process of growing and maturing is to grow out of that and be aware of our needs and respect our needs, but also aware of other needs and respect other people's needs and don't, people, don't treat people like objects, treat people like people and have freedom for each other, respect for each other, and be able to balance those two words. So you're not yeah. living in a space of the sacrifice. Yep, I really, I really, those are some very valid points. You know, the whole thing with narcissism is, is it's normal in certain stages of development. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. it was Freud who called little kids, you know, his, um, you know, his, uh, was it his majesty, the toddler, yes. you know? Yeah. Um, his majesty, the baby, because it is, it's, it's all about you all the time. And, Mm -hmm. and teenagers can also very much be that same way, but, and I, but we grow out of that. That's part of that maturing. And I love what he had to say about a person cannot be emotionally immature and spiritually mature. It's, it's like a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And if there is that unhealthy ego there, um, this immature ego, it's going to filter everything through that level of understanding, which is going to be really what we would consider dysfunctional because it's so immature. It's like this person's going through life with the mindset of a, of a 13 year old and they're an adult and that's why their life isn't working because they're not emotionally mature. We have to read this book. I promise that you're going to love it. I'll read it. Yeah. It sounds interesting. One of the things it says to, and I think that's going to help everyone is this is because so many Christians are emotionally mature. That's why no one wants you to be ever angry. And everyone always like, get over that. Just forgive. Don't be angry. Mm, that is all based in a emotional immaturity and spiritual immaturity. That's all based in that. And he actually gives some great scriptures. So like for people who are really interested, you should go to that book. It's, it's a good book. It's a really good book. I, 
I'm in. And the, yeah. the, it's so crazy because I read this book just after the confidence game and one of the last chapters in the confidence game, I'm going back to the book, <laughs> is about how people use the, you know, church as a huge con game. Mm-hmm. And that was like breaking my heart at the end because there was, there was this married couple that they were faking healing miracles and literally just created this whole church around, um, you know, this, this honest manipulation and they got so much money off the people. It was, it was functioning like a cult, you know, and it, it's, it happens still. It does. Well, what's wild is it can even happen with the same people like Jim and Tammy yes. Baker, right? Like they got busted for embezzlement and um, all kinds of stuff. Well, they'd served their jail time and he's back. He's back at it. He's preaching. People are throwing money at him again. Yep. And you just think, oh my goodness. But people, a lot of people, it's that naivete. They, they love that mm-hmm. redemption story. And this yeah. thought of, oh, you know what? He was lost before. He's found God. Now he's found. He's on the right path. And it's, my goodness, you know, yeah. it's, where is the line in the sand? I mean, just because a person says that they've changed doesn't mean they have. And we, I was watching a video the other night with Jim Baker and he um, was selling the... <laughs> so it's people like him. I just hope that hell is real. Because it's it just, don't worry, hope is real. It is <laughs> hell, 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 hell. I'm sorry, hell yeah. is real. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. The local tour says, Yeah, Jim Baker's survival of food. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. He was selling, you know, apocalypse, the end of the world, revelation comes, and it's all of this. It was these packages of food, and a lot of them came in ice these- cream because if he has ice cream for apocalypse I go get it, it, well it, it was twenty five hundred dollars I think it was twenty five hundred or twenty five two thousand five hundred oh my god dollars for like so many meals it's basically you know like the, the military yeah Russia you know, yeah. they had a whole production they had a choir there people were singing and they were talking about preparing for the end times and here you can make French Hold toast up. and it's delicious Are you real? is this on the public yeah. summer now oh I don't know you can find it on YouTube how long ago was it happening? Not, I, I don't know. I'd have to go look. People are calling in. Oh, this is so great. You know, just hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's my credit card number. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for doing it for all of us. We put cells without you, right? We would all, yeah. That's but it's yes, heartbreaking so, and it's so angering. It is angering because, but it's the same, it's the same mechanic. They use something that people invest so much faith into to 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 play it's just i get oh man like my eyes i just my eyes start twitching (laughs) so i'm a christian i love jesus do you know how it pisses me off i so he was here is what he was the good news okay (laughs) this is the good news no girl this is the good news Mm -hmm. because they dare to use the name of the god and use you know and there's this verse in the bible that whoever does something to get those little ones stumbles so we christians we are god's children so we can be called the little ones so everyone who does something for us to stumble in our faith is freaking going to hell like they are in such a troubles like it's i mean i feel so sorry to them because they're not gonna like what's gonna happen to them so well i you know i think anybody that's manipulating vulnerable people out of money like that using fear is um it's just not okay by me you know when you think about there's probably a lot of it's just it's just so sad you know you see people that they really they're good people they're they're older they want to prepare for their grandkids or what have you and it it just oh my gosh like remember this come on people were calling and pretending they had a boyfriend or that no the niece or a nephew that they didn't see so long and the people, all people were buying in and then sending the money. Grandma, I'm in Florida yep. and my car broke. Oh, Felix. Yes, Grandma, Felix. <laughs> mm-hmm. How is your mom? She's good, right? My car broke. Can you send me money order? Right? Stuff yep. like that. It's, it's so crazy, but they do that. And it's the same 
it's it's the same one you know I, for me it's heartbreaking when woman is manipulated out you know and she's wrapped out of her respect and freedom and just you know the experience of being a person through the psychological abuse it's yeah it, it's the same thing well men or women i it just yeah, or men anybody or women, yeah. anybody that yeah humans vulnerable it just really brings out the mama bear in me like big time i know yeah. i'm a mama so believe me i'm a bad mama bear yeah i really I, bad mama bear. I just think <laughs> yeah. why can't people just go scam like go scam child molesters do you know what i mean like like if you're gonna be a scam artist could you at least like have decency to scam the bad like, people <laughs> go after you know people yeah uh, just uh, uh, frustrating. Okay, well, that's okay. it. <laughs> so, okay, so the book we were just talking about was called The Confidence Game by Maria uh, Konnikova. And um, is that Russian? That name? Yeah. You think so? That's a good, that's a good Russian name. It's fun to say. Yeah, Maria Konnikova. It's a yeah. Russian name. She actually says something about in about Russia at the very beginning. I don't remember what was it. Uh, yeah, I don't. Oh, I think you're right. I don't remember either, but yeah, she said right. something. Um, so this book was basically kind of an anatomy, understanding con artists, and there, it's full of various scenarios and stories of how people have been conned. It's it's interesting. It's narrative nonfiction, if that's your thing. It's it's interesting. I would say it's entertaining to just hear all these types of stories. The book we're reading next month for well, I guess this month for August because we're behind is called. And I lost the cover of it, but it's called True Refuge by Tara Brock. Here's the spine of the book that I bought, used. Um, and this is a book about mindfulness. It's about handling trauma and crisis. And um, it has really great reviews. So I'm super excited about it. I haven't started it yet, but I will be starting it here in the near future. Book Club is the last Thursday, normally, the last Thursday of every month at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It runs for a couple hours, depending on the book and depending on who all is able to hop on. Um, we'll be on the 29th. Of is it, oh, thank you for looking that up. Yeah. No, I don't look up. My birthday, 26th on Monday. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Okay. Uh, and That's why I remember. <laughs> Good deal. I'll have to get a card in the mail here soon. No. Um, oh my God. What did I do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was that? I was going to say, oh, the audibletrial.com slash thrive after abuse. If you're interested in signing up, you get a free audiobook. If you're not, but you still want an audiobook, ask your local library. It takes them a couple of weeks normally to get it in, but you can download an app on your phone. It's called Hoopla that most libraries use. And oh. Can I say something about Audible? Because mm. this is a great thing to know. If uh -huh. if you subscribe and you have the credit, uh, they have such a great customer service. Like I read six books this year that I didn't like. I returned them even a couple of months after they gave me the credits back. Yeah, and it's good to know. Yeah, so I have six credits now. I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, so the reason I got into Audible is because I was really having restless mind, and I think we survivors have that. So instead of um, watching something or like just thinking about something that didn't make sense, I'm actually was making me feel worse. I was actually listening to like fantasy books and they so mm -hmm. great because they take you out of this reality into true fantasy because we are, yes. we are in this fake fantasy, you know, like that is really intertwined with the reality. So that's kind of very sickening. But like, give yourself a break from like all of that and listen to something just completely different. Don't listen just to books about narcissists. Listen to yeah. something fun, you know? It's really cool. A total break. I, I refer to this as my trash YouTube. Like there's um, trash just channels that are all about drama and makeup and stuff that I am so not into. But it's such a, a change for my brain that it just helps yeah. me relax because I'm just not into it. Uh, another thing too, if anybody's looking for videos to escape into, Bob Ross, I found out the other night, has uh, a ton of videos. If you're about, I guess about my age or older, you remember. Painting. It just, he's such just a lovely human being. And- Is it the he, painting guy? Yes. 
You know, and he's back on. People are painting, actually watching him. Yes. I believe, well, he passed away um, a while back, but his his videos are still on. And I hadn't watched him since I was a kid. I remember watching him on PBS when I was, you know, eight years old or so. And it was magical back then. But as an adult watching it, it I could see how people get into that. It's very relaxing. I don't know. So if people you're doing it, anxiety, people actually paint. It's fun. Yeah. If you're struggling with anxiety, just turn on some Bob Ross videos. It's <laughs> It's amazing very asmr it's wonderful, and paint, wonderful painting is really helping too seriously so that was a very different book club dana today <laughs> yes it was i appreciate we covered a lot of random ground but uh that was very random <laughs> sorry oh i, I anyway me too we're <laughs> random together but i just thought the book was too narrative too like academic and you know it was good for us to go to some of the points and connect them more into our experience because I think that's what really benefits us people mm -hmm. yeah that's why yeah anyway thank you so much yes thank you for being here I always enjoy our conversations so Me I'm too. Thank you. always enjoyable to see people in the chat and what they have to say and what's going on so I'm, I hope this conversation <laughs> is valuable to some of you <laughs> And if it's not, it's going to make you laugh. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Uh, but thank you guys for being here. And I'll see it. We'll see you next Wednesday at the live stream, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And Angie and I, the plan is for us to start up again next week. Um, so they have plenty of serious normal stuff coming up. That's yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So as always, lots of love to you guys. Uh, you are not alone. Nope. You are not crazy and you can move forward and heal from this. So take care and just lots of love to you. Thank you. I'll see you next week. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>